Of course, mutual funds are very important institutions. In the U.S., they manage something like $21 trillion. They hold 25% of the corporate equity. Uh, and uh, of the actively managed equity funds, about 70%, sorry, of, of the equity funds, about 70% of the AUM is actively managed. And uh, of course, there are, are, are myriad studies that examine funds' performance, return performance. Uh, our focus in this paper is instead on the, the behavior and characteristics of, uh, of mutual funds, active mutual funds. And we think this actually is a way of getting some novel insights into the economics of, of these funds, particularly in terms of scale this economy. So of course, following Burke and Green in uh, 2004, uh, they pointed out with, that with uh, this economy of scale, uh, in actively, actively managed funds in equilibrium, money is basically going to flow in and out of funds to sort of equilibrate uh, alphas to zero. Um, but then if you're, of course, if you're trying to look for evidence that uh, such diseconomies exist and you look for it in returns, you've got this inherent challenge. If the expected performance or the alpha is zero, then trying to link performance to scale faces that inherent challenge. Now, uh, some studies have, have uh, surmounted that challenge and, 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 got, and looked at evidence that deals with returns, um, including some early work that we've done. Um, but we think actually that, that, that looking at fund characteristics and, and the trade-offs among them provides very strong evidence of scale this economies and, and in that sense gives us uh, you know, a, a, a really valuable source of insights into the economics of, of mutual funds. So our main contributions here is first an, e an equilibrium model that's going to link key fund characteristics. Uh, these characteristics include the, the size of the fund, the fund's expense ratio, or think of it as its fee rate, uh, the fund's turnover, and also the liquidity of the fund's portfolio. Uh, and we find strong empirical evidence of implied trade-offs among these characteristics that are consistent with, uh, with scale diseconomies. Uh, one of these characteristics I mentioned, the liquidity of the fund's portfolio, uh, we introduced this as a new characteristic. As we, we, we introduce a measure that characterizes the fund's portfolio, portfolio liquidity. Um, and we show that you actually take this measure that we derive sort of from first principles of trading costs. And uh, so you can decompose it into the uh, average liquidity the stocks held, as well as the diversification of the portfolio. And that second dimension is rather key, because if you think about how, how liquid a portfolio is, um, the liquidity of the stuff in the portfolio is one dimension of that, but it's not the whole story. You know, just think of, think of having uh, a portfolio where all the money's in one stock and what it would cost you to trade, let's say, 1% uh, of that portfolio versus a portfolio where you've got 100 stocks and you want to trade 1% of that portfolio. You're going to be trading a much smaller amount of each stock in the latter case. So we think that makes sense to think of that portfolio as more liquid in, the, in that second case. Uh, and in fact, the diversification of the portfolio something also has something to say about. We have a new diversification measure, which we can also uh, show decomposes into two components, uh, the coverage of the portfolio, how many stocks are being held uh, versus the total number of stocks that the, that the fund could hold in, in its benchmark. Um, and then second, what we call balance, these are the weights uh, on however many stocks the portfolio has, how close do those weights resemble uh, market cap weights. Uh, we also introduce a new measure of, of fund activeness that combines um, uh, the, the, the portfolio liquidity, which is going to reflect the holdings of the portfolio, but also how, how much the fund turns over, um, which is sort of a, a, a novel measure, uh, dimension of activeness relative to some existing measures. Um, and we also sort of rethink this notion of scale. Uh, scale is traditionally thought of as the size of the fund. What we argue is that you should really think of scale as combining that fund size with how active the fund is managed, its, its turnover and its liquidity. So uh, we get a number of implied trade-offs among the characteristics of the fund. First of all, uh, we show that uh, uh, in, in, our, in our model, we get an implication that um, a smaller fund, higher fee, and lower turnover should all lead to a less liquid portfolio. We find that in the data. Um, also, if you take those, those first three characteristics and also add to them a, a less diversified portfolio, that should imply that the fund would be holding more liquid stocks, and we find that as well. Um, and controlling for those above things, if you also add in lower coverage, uh, lower coverage 
uh, should imply a higher balance. In other words, let's all trade off between those two dimensions of uh, diversification, and we do find that in the data as well. Um, and also, a, a smaller fund and a, a fund that charges a higher fee, a higher expense ratio, should also uh, display greater activeness, and we find that as well. Uh, and finally, uh, a smaller funds should be potentially more expensive, charge higher fee rates, and we also find that in the data. I mean, these are all things that basically come out of a model that, that uh, uh, rests on there being these scale diseconomies. So, of course, our literature, our, our, our paper relates this to the literature in a number of dimensions. Um, although our, our focus on characteristics, we think, is actually fairly novel. Um, there are some familiar concepts. Of course, foremost among these would be the literature on decrease in returns to scale, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, that literature, by and large, relates performance to fund size. We instead look at uh, fund size related to other multiple characteristics in, in the set of joint trade-offs. Um, and also, there's a, there's a long-standing literature on portfolio diversification uh, that's pr proposed measures that, that include both number of stocks as well as the concentration of weights, and our diversification measure really blends both of those ideas uh, from the literature. So let me talk a little bit about this portfolio liquidity measure, because that's the characteristic of a fund that's sort of novel here that we introduce. Um, and the basic idea is here pr is pretty simple. Um, a portfolio is more liquid uh, if it's less costly to trade a fraction of it. And uh, the perspective we take here in thinking about uh, liquidity of a portfolio is to think of a portfolio as an asset. So, you know, and, and we think about liquidity of an asset, we, we generally associate lower liquidity with higher cost of trading it. If we think of a portfolio in the same way, th then we can sort of think of a trading cost um, approach to, to thinking about what liquidity would look like the liquidity measure we, we, we end up with looks like this thing here that, that depends on the number of stocks in the portfolio, the, the portfolio's weights on each stock, uh, and the weight that each stock gets in a, an evaluated benchmark that would be uh, you know, the, the fund's uh, benchmark. Uh, that measure lies between zero and one. Um, of course, the least liquid portfolio is going to be a portfolio that holds the single or smallest, least liquid, least liquid stock in the benchmark, and the most liquid portfolio is going to be the benchmark portfolio itself, which have a liquidity of one. Uh, so how does this measure arise? Well, uh, we start with a fairly simple assumption that, um, that larger trades have higher proportional costs. In other words, the, the more of a stock's outstanding market cap you trade, the higher the proportional cost of trading that's going to be. And we just posit that as a simple proportional relation here, where um, you have this little, little c, and, and we assume that little c is going to be the same for all the stocks in the portfolio's benchmark. So if you have, for example, a, a, a fund with a small cap growth benchmark, we're going to assume that little c parameter is the same for all the small cap growth funds. And the, the, the idea is that little c then multiplies the, the dollar amount you're trading as a fraction of the stock's outstanding market cap. So as I say, the greater the fraction of the market cap you're trading, the higher your, your, uh, your trading cost per dollar of stock traded. Um, so if you, if you now think of the um, portfolio as an asset that you're going to trade, and you're going to trade uh, D as the total dollar amount traded, the dollar amount traded in each stock is just going to be D times WI, WI, the weight in, in stock I in the portfolio. So then if you just substitute to get the total, the total cost of trading, uh, you know, summed up as the cost per stock, and the cost per stock just follows this relation I, I put up uh, initially, uh, then you can see that, that, that um, uh, you can re rewrite things such that this thing I defined as L pops out here as the uh, liquidity measure that enters the uh, trading costs. So basically, the, uh, the liquidity measure we derive here relates directly to thinking about trading the portfolio as an asset. So now we take that, that characteristic, that liquidity characteristic, and sort of include it in a model where we, we take a, a given active fund's trading costs, and we allow it to depend fairly arbitrarily on three things, the size of the fund, how much the fund turns over, and how liquid is the fund's portfolio. We allow the exponents on those things to be 
uh, fairly general. Basically, it seemed that, that, uh, that, ga that gamma, lambda, and, and phi are all uh, positive. There's some skill the fund has, we'll call it mu, and then this function g that depends on turnover and liquidity represents how actively the fund applies that skill. Uh, we can be fairly general about that in our, in our basic model, the g function. Uh, we're going to assume the fund maximizes its fee revenue, uh, which is its, its fee rate times its, times its AUM. And we're going to impose the simple Burke-Green equilibrium. Um, you know, the fund is facing decrease in returns to scale here, uh, imposed by this trading cost function. So uh, the Burke-Green argument will apply here. It's just that in equilibrium, money's going to move around. Investors will allocate to each fund to make the uh, expected alpha uh, zero in equilibrium. Um, that's then going to imply the fee revenue, which we're doing here by capital F, is, uh, is going to be given by this function of, of, uh, of the turnover, the liquidity, and the, and the fee rate, given, given the uh, fund skill mu. And if we simply take a first order condition with respect to the fee rate, uh, we basically get this, this empirical trade-off we're going to investigate that relates uh, this, this new characteristic, this portfolio liquidity, to the, the size of the fund, A, its fee rate or expense ratio, F, and the turnover, T. And uh, uh, the, the, um, the Bs, B0 through B3 in that, in that equation are all going to be positive. Uh, and in particular, the, the, they don't depend on the fund-specific skill. That sort of drops out here of the first order condition. So we're going to look at, at evidence here based on a nearly 2,800 active U.S. mutual funds uh, uh, from 79 to 2014. Uh, we sort of build on some earlier work we've done here in constructing a database that uh, combines CRISP, Morningstar, and, uh, and, and Reuters in this case um, to get also the holdings re required. Um, and um, we sort of exclude index funds, not equi non-equity funds, international funds, um, industry funds, target date funds, funds of funds, funds with size less than 15 million. So these are basically more or less plain vanilla active equity mutual funds. Uh, we're going to run a panel regression where we put the log liquidity on the left and then the, the, the fund size, fee rate, and turnover on the right. Um, and uh, we're going to add to this uh, regression sector quarter fixed effects. So that effectively, effectively treats this as a cross-sectional relation that uh, we're looking at holding at a given point in time. Um, and one of the things that the, that, the, that the sector quarter fixed effect does is we can uh, basically treat the L, the liquidity measure, as being defined with respect to a sector-specific benchmark. Uh, so if you took our, our liquidity measure defined with respect to an overall market benchmark, uh, to get it defined with respect to a, a sector-specific benchmark, you would just have to multiply that thing by the ratio of the sector AUM to the market AUM, and the fixed effect in, in the regression basically allows that, that multiplication to occur. Um, and the little c, we treat as constant within a given sector and quarter. In other words, we treat this model as a cross-sectional model. Uh, in principle, you could also apply it in a time series, except that, that, that we, we, we don't do that primarily because this, this little c we think is likely to vary non-trivially over time as liquidity conditions in the market vary. Uh, you know, I've done some early work with Lou Bosch on time varying liquidity in the market. We don't think it's a constant thing. Um, but we do think it makes sense to think of this as a, as a, as a cross-sectional implication. Uh, and then we cluster by funds in, in getting standard errors. Uh, and in this regression, we expect that the, the, the A1, the coefficient on, on log size of the fund, should be positive. Uh, the coefficient on the expense ratio should be negative, And the coefficient on turnover should be, should be positive. And um, indeed, that's what we find rather strongly in, in the data. Uh, you can see in the, in the fourth column, we have the multiple regression. It, it puts all three in at once, where the, the dependent variable is the log liquidity. Uh, you can see we get very strongly fund size entering positively, the uh, expense ratio negatively, and turnover uh, positively. Um, this, this liquidity measure that I, that I showed you uh, earlier, how we, how we get it, you can take it and actually decompose it in, in, into products of some stuff. If you stare at those things and, and try to give them names, it looks to us like, like one of these components we can call stock liquidity. It's basically just the, 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 the simple arithmetic average of each stock's 
size, its market cap, uh, relative to the average market cap of stocks in the benchmark. Um, now, of course, there are many measures of stock-specific liquidity, but I mean, market cap uh, is, 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 is a fairly popular and, and um, effective one. Um, so we call that first thing stock liquidity. And then the second thing looks like to us diversification. And in fact, the diversification component we can actually break up as a product of, of two components that um, represent both the coverage and the balance. That first ratio, um, the N over NM, is effectively just a, a function of the, the number of stocks in the portfolio versus those in the benchmark. And that second thing there in the, in the square brackets, the one plus that variance term, basically just measures how close the weights are to market cap weight. So we can actually take the diversification measure and write it as a product of the portfolio's coverage times, times its balance. And both of those measures are between uh, zero and one. And that allows us to look at some additional trade-offs. Well, before I get to that, let me just show you a little bit of history. Um, liquidity over time has, has more than doubled for active equity mutual funds. They've gotten much more liquid, um, primarily because diversification has nearly tripled. Uh, the stock liquidity is actually, well, it, it, it sort of went, went, went up and then back down. It's not had a great trend, but the diversification has, has uh, trended sharply upward, certainly since the, uh, you know, the, the, the internet bubble. Um, and both components of diversification, both balance and coverage, have, have, have both trended up sharply. So this is, a, you know, there, there's been this pretty well understood trend toward closet indexing, and I think this, this, uh, these, these plots show it pretty dramatically. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the coverage has gone up, the number of funds are holding more stocks, despite the fact the number of stocks in the market, uh, uh, publicly traded stocks in the market, has, has um, gone down pretty sharply since the, uh, you know, the late 90s around the, around the internet bubble. Um, so as I said, we can get to actually other trade-offs. We can look at these components of portfolio liquidity. For example, we, if we regress diversification on those first three characteristics plus stock liquidity, we should get a, a strongly negative coefficient on stock liquidity. And of course, the other coefficients, as, I, as, as, we, as we got earlier, and we, in fact, we do that. Um, if you add balance to that equation on the right-hand side and regress coverage, you should get a negative coefficient on balance, and we do. Um, and reversing things, put balance on the left and coverage on the right, you should also get negative, and we do. And finally, if you put stock liquidity on the left, put diversification uh, and the other three characteristics on the right, you should get a negative coefficient on stock on diversification, and, and, and we do. So all these, all these trade-offs among the various components of, of, of liquidity also emerge pretty strongly in the data. Um, I mentioned fund activeness, so if you think of this skill times this activeness that depends on both turnover and liquidity, um, we should, we should think of that as, as something that, that uh, also uh, should relate to other characteristics of the fund, and particularly with decreased returns to scale, um, we should find that, that, that funds that, that are um, uh, more expensive, have a higher fee rate, and uh, are, 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 are smaller, should be more, should be more active. Uh, and, uh, if we then regress this, this activeness measure, by the way, that we define here, if I just back up a bit, this activeness measure, yeah, <laughs> where the light is, um, is it's just a simple product. Um, the t, 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 t times L to minus half is a special case of a, of, a, of a more general version of activeness. It turns out to be, if you write activeness as just a product of T times L, each raised to some power, um, the powers have to obey a restriction in order for there to be a, a solution of the first order conditions for T, L, and F. And a special case of that restriction is in fact this, sort of the simplest case that goes back to the way we actually wrote our, our derivation of liquidity measure. We just have this activeness measure be T times L to minus half. So basically embeds both turnover and, and liquidity and how actively the fund is, is, uh, is managing its money. Um, and we find that indeed, as predicted, um, the funds that are smaller and charge higher fee rates, uh, which of course other things equal, will tend to make them smaller, uh, are, are, are more active. Uh, and these, these trade-offs come through very strongly as well. 
uh, in the data. Um, and then finally, a lot of these trade-offs come through very strongly, even in simple correlations. Um, so if you think, for example, about uh, the relation between fund size and expense ratio, um, you know, just e even going back to the simple intuition in Burke and Green, you know, all other things equal, if you charge a high fee rate, you're going to have less AUM, and uh, we find that emerges very strongly in the data. In fact, here I'm showing you both cross-sectional and simple time series correlations, uh, and you get, you get strong relations uh, and, and both dimensions for the, 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 the larger funds are cheaper. Um, also, funds that trade less and are, and, and are larger, uh, funds that trade less are, are both larger and cheaper. Uh, as again, this simple intuition uh, about, about uh, scale this economies. And uh, finally, funds with more liquid portfolios are also larger and cheaper. Um, maybe just I'll finish up with um, a couple of plots here. One is to show you some cross-sectional correlations and how they plot over time. Uh, these things are so strong that basically the, the signs never flip. So this is just plotting here month by, or sorry, quarter by quarter, uh, the, the cross-sectional correlations of, um, you know, portfolio liquidity with fund size, turnover with expense ratio, portfolio liquidity with expense ratio, fund size with expense ratio. Um, these things have not only their predicted signs overall, but every, every, at every period in the sample. Fidelity Magellan was the world's largest active equity mutual fund, and maybe the largest mutual fund, uh, right around the uh, you know, turn of the millennium, that when sort of height of the internet bubble. Um, you know, Peter Lynch had this long, spectacular record that basically generated uh, huge growth in AUM. Uh, and then and since then, since, since the turn of the millennium, uh, their AUM has, has uh, dropped considerably. So what, what, our, what our story would suggest is that, well, as, as, the, as the AUM grew substantially, they would have to have uh, managed a more liquid portfolio. And indeed, if you look at our portfolio liquidity measure, uh, you can see how, how closely it tracks with the uh, uh, Magellan AUM. So um, again, it's a, very, it's a very simple idea in the paper that uh, these, these, these characteristics of funds and the trade-offs among them are basically strong evidence kind of staring you in the face. <laughs> about scale of this economies. Uh, so just to conclude here, let me just review. Uh, the strong relations we get are that uh, for small, smaller funds, higher fees, lower turnover imply less liquid portfolio. Uh, those three things plus less diversification imply more liquid stocks. Um, lower coverage, controlling for the other things should imply higher balance. Smaller funds, higher fees imply higher activeness. And smaller funds should imply higher fees. We find all those in the data. And then in addition, we think this, this, this concept of portfolio liquidity is, uh, uh, we think is, is a novel thing. We don't know of any other measure of portfolio liquidity out there. And uh, you know, we're hoping to do more uh, in thinking about that as well.